This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. And I know we have several people who would like to ask questions, so if you will take your place at the microphones, please. And what we have decided to do in this second panel is a, a, we're going to adjust just a little bit so that if you have cost-oriented questions as well, we would particularly encourage those because that's the topic that was to be addressed the second half. But uh, feel free to, uh, to, to start and uh, state your name and tell us briefly where you come from. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Stan Roth. I belong to a group of uh, senior citizens, advocates for senior issues. And we're kind of interested in the next generation. Uh, the largest uninsured population is the 27-year-olds, the 35-year-olds in our community and a couple of them are, are my sons whose employers do not provide insurance and as kids are coming out of college the jobs that they're able to get many are not paying them a living wage and they're not providing health insurance these young people are said that well they can go to the emergency room well you know where they go they don't go anywhere you don't even see them. And there's the beginning of obesity, coronary art artery disease, uh, blood pressure, high blood pressure, and you'll only see them when they're already pretty far along and it's going to cost the society a ton more money. I wonder if you uh, could comment on an idea of providing a Medicare type benefit to this younger population of basic care that would be preventative in nature to avoid paying later for the high costs when they get 30 and 40 and 50 and 60. Uh, you know, we, we went into Medicare to help the elderly first and Johnson thought, well, they'd want the same for their grandkids. Well, I think I want the same thing for the younger generation, to have an opportunity to start in a good, healthy position. And if they get a good start, they will get educated and be likely to continue a healthy pattern. So what do you think of an idea like that on a national level? I guess I'll start off, um, you know, employer-sponsored insurance really is the foundation of healthcare today, and as you pointed out, um, some people don't have it. Um, the reason why I believe many employers are dropping that coverage is directly, again, related to the cost, and there are two factors, uh, one which we talked about already, that being the cost shift, the underpayment of Medicaid and Medicare being added to the premiums that employers would then have to pick up. Uh, but another issue uh, that, as a society, we, we touched on briefly, but which we really haven't dived into, and that is the, the impact of behavior. Uh, some studies have shown that 50% of all health care costs are directly attributed to the lifestyle choices of the individual, what we eat, whether we exercise, uh, drinking, uh, alcohol, and or smoking. Uh, if those behaviors were all uh, more appropriately uh, conducted by each of us, and I put myself in that category too, here it is Friday, and I have not exercised for 30 minutes uh, three times this week yet, um, these, these are things that would keep us healthy and as a result, lower the cost of insurance or lower the cost of health care because we wouldn't use it as much and therefore make it more affordable. Uh, our solution, our hope, would not be another government program, uh, which again was like, would likely be underfunded and dictate rates to providers that don't cover costs, but let's take things as a society that can help lower our utilization of health care, uh, eliminate the cost shift of the two government programs, and allow private private insurance to either be one more affordable for employers to offer their employees or for those of us as consumers uh, to purchase. I think you raise a superb point in terms of trying to prevent today uh, the chronic diseases that we're going to see tomorrow. 
and we have crossed that road with several points in the discussion today. Mary Ann talked about the fact that Michigan has more uh, hospital discharges for several events, coronary events, and things that are based on preventable activities. Um, we know that if we can do a better job of maintaining health, we won't have to pay the high bills later. Uh, we know that despite how much money we put into health care, that is only going to leverage 10% of a patient's health, that 40 or 50% of it is leveraged by the patient's personal behavior. And if, if we can catch patients early enough, um, we, we can bend the cost curve for what's the costly services that we won't have to pay later. Now, why don't we do that? Well, there's a whole variety of reasons. Number one, uh, the return on that investment is 30, 40 years down the road. And it's hard for an insurance company to say, yep, I'm, I'm going to put money in now to try to make sure that somebody will save money 30 years down the road. It may not be me. Uh, secondly, our current reimbursement system does really not reimburse our, our health care providers well for that kind of activity. Uh, the current system base is based on value. I told you earlier that, gee, if I only had the time, I would tell you how to solve the health care problem. Well, I'll, I'll do it in 13 seconds. We need to improve the health of the population. We need to quit focusing on the treatment of illness and how we're going to pay cardiologists less and hospitals less and start focusing on the patient today and figure out how we're going to keep them healthy uh, so they won't need that cardiologist and that cardiac procedure. That's, that's absolutely the way to go. And another place where we crossroads in that discussion is the patient-centered medical home. That is the, um, where, where medicine is grabbing onto that concept. But I will go back and say it again, you, you can't rely on medicine alone to improve patient health care. The patient's got to be a part of it. Thank you, Dennis. I think Bondi would like to say something. Yeah, and I, you know, just a, a corollary end of that because I, I, I think that um, you know, I, I have a daughter who's at Michigan State right now and, you know, every so many months then we're looking at student loans. I think you raise an important point, not just because you want people to develop a relationship with health care early and to sustain it so that it helps helps them understand some of the, the impact of their behaviors. But there's a piece that I'm very concerned about just in terms of looking at my own family. And I don't know how many of our students here take out student loans. My guess is there's a whole bunch of them. And at some point they're going to come out, they're going to end up in a job probably without health coverage unless we do a much better job of figuring out how to get that coverage in place. And then they're going to be looking at however we're going to do, if I'm going to buy it on the open market or whatever, and what are they going to buy it with. Um, you know, it, it, we're, 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 we're taking chunks of money out, you know, based on the future. You're going to get a job, so you're going to be able to pay back that student loan. Well, as you're paying back that student loan, I didn't have student loans. We could afford college back, you know, when dinosaurs ruled the earth with all those <laughs> baby boomers. But, you know, now I do. And, you know, if you're going to walk out with sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars in debt, then these, this notion that we're going to buy health product is, is really tough unless an employer or somebody's helping you to do that. I, that's, that's sort of number one. Number two is, um, goes back to our experience in Muskegon in terms of the access health product. And this, this is the behavioral issue. So we offer our product, it costs you $46 a month. If you work for an employer, it takes our product, it's going to cost you $46 a month, they'll pay $46, and then there's the, there's the subsidy. And what our experience has been in the 20-something-year-old men is, first of all, they believe they'll live forever. And as we talk about it, it's like, okay, 46 bucks a month for health care, 46 bucks a month maybe beer. for beer, beer, <laughs> and health care, beer, health care, beer, beer wins. Yeah. It does. <laughs> they know that. It's consumer choices. And it gets exactly, you know, it, at some point we have to look at what drives cost and behaviors and those relationships. Toughest group to reach are young men. And I, I appreciate you have sons out there who are out of it. But the, the thing about men is they just really wait until they're awfully sick or they're married and their wife drags them off. I mean, you know. <laughs> we have behavioral issues there. And health is shared equally. I mean, I, you know. They're young and they're immortal. Yeah. 
Steve, did you want to say? Sure. I, you know, I, I would build on Bondi's point too that I think is interesting, um, and perhaps. You know, I thought last night if you were here and you saw uh, Michael Tanner, he turned, you know, one of the questions on his head when he, I think it was, what role should government play in health care? And he said, that's not the appropriate question, right? Is that, that uh, and he didn't want to didn't want to go there because he didn't think government should play any role in, in health care. And I suppose, you know, we were going to talk about, you know, how much would reform cost? And so I think I would turn that question on its head and say, how much is it costing you already? Uh, and, and that's perhaps the, the appropriate question. And, and, and Bonnie and I spoke a little bit about this at dinner last night. And, and anybody's had me, Courtney, I apologize for telling this story again, but I graduated from the University of North Carolina in, in, uh, in 1991. My last tuition check was, was $475. It cost $3,000 for room, board, and tuition. So if you look at the state budgets, every state budget, what was the one portion of the budget that grew last year in Michigan? No. Medicaid. Medicaid, right? Medicaid was the one portion that grew last year. You know, Medicaid since 2002 covered about 13 percent of the population here in Michigan. Today is 20 percent of the population. So whether you realize it or not, and all you young guys, this is really important. Why do you suppose our tuition keeps going up, right? So you're paying for that, right? Where is the one place that costs can be transferred, right? Costs are being transferred to you in the form of higher tuition, in the, and that's what's causing you to have uh, more student loans. So all of these things build on each other. It's the same reason perhaps we're seeing, you know, cuts in our, in, in, in you know, the K, K through 12 funding. Again, you know, we can't cut Medicaid. So, the, and the other question I would ask, and I, the reason why, I, what gets me a long point to your question is, you know, how do we, we pay for this? Um, and of course, you've probably all seen, we, we've talked about ad nauseum about, you know, how bankrupt the system is. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's the scary thing is that, you know, how do we, how do we, how would we pay for a Medicare type program for, for young uninsured insured people. So, and I'll, I'll read you this again. I'm sorry to read so many things today. This, and again, this is why I'm uh, Mr. Mr. Sunshine here. Uh, this is from The Economist uh, last week, and uh, the, the article is entitled The Dark Ages. And, and their, their economists uh, estimate that it may be 15 years before the state of Michigan returns to prosperity. But I'll, I'll read you this, this one part. So in the meantime, the state must grapple with an uncomfortable reality as government and workforce are framed around an economy that no longer exists. So revenue from Michigan's general fund has fallen by 43% since 2000, adjusted for inflation. Prisons and Medicaid gobble up almost half of the general fund. So Medicaid was about 30% of the budget this year. Uh, and leaving little money to spend elsewhere. Again, those are the cuts we're seeing. So adding extra tuition onto your backs. So uh, despite all the talk of universities' importance and funding, funding for higher education has dropped by 22% since 2002. Michigan will be even more pinched next year as money from the Recovery Act runs out. Mitchell Bean, director of the nonpartisan House Physical Agency, argues that Michigan's revenue system is in desperate need of reform. But even if the state extends its sales tax to services as well as goods, uh, it will need to reconsider what it can can afford to provide. So, what should state government really do, Mr. Bean asked. And again, I think you know those are the difficult questions that we're going to be wrestling with. Do we provide health care? Do we provide more funding for K through 12? Do we provide funding for higher education? And of course, you know what you're seeing, right? Are, are those burdens are being shifted uh, in ways uh, that that we never thought. And, and you know, I ask my students again: Did you ever think? <laughs> that you as a college student would be pitted against someone on Medicaid. And you really are. So that's what you, know, you need to understand, right? Is that, that you know, we're, we're pitting each other uh, because the, the pie is, is shrunk. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the desperate state that I believe we're in. So um, you may all need a Prozac after this, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. As a, as a follow-up, uh, having worked for the physician community for so long, I, I do this 
uh, automatically. Yes, the amount of money in Medicaid did go up last year because the amount of number of people in, covered by Medicaid went up. The actual physician community and the hospital community, the provider community, took an 8% cut last year. So it, it, it's not that healthcare providers aren't trying to uh, do their part to support the, the hard times in Michigan. Yeah. Um, David, I think you want to yeah, say something? Sure. Yeah, I think we should have a model that would cover uh, everyone, including the young adults. I think one of the tricky parts of what you asked about was, shouldn't they have a model that would provide for some prevention issues for them? They should, but the, the problem also when you have no insurance, uh, uh, friends of ours, uh, their son was between jobs, for one month he had no insurance. And in that one month, driving across New York State, he actually got an appendicitis. He went to the emergency room. His bill for one day of stay, because his mother and sister, who were both nurses, went and pulled him out of the hospital in one day. His bill for one day in that local community hospital was $30,000. And because he didn't have insurance, um, he was exposed to the highest charge rates they had. And his CAT scan, which we sort of think a CAT scan might be 1000 bucks, his CAT scan was $5,000. So uh, you, you, you need coverage on everything, and we need it negotiated at some appropriate levels. Um, one of the things I think that, that helps with this a little bit is some of the things around value-based benefit design, uh, where you begin to create these incentives. We've been talking about lifestyle and things like this. We're actually looking at the insurance plan for our company for the coming year. We have two benefit designs right now, a basic benefit and an enhanced benefit. We're actually looking at three levels uh, with this in the coming year. And the basic will be for a person who's got health indicators out of bounds and they're not trying, meaning smoking and they're not trying to quit, BMI over 30 and they're not trying to reduce it. Um, the intermediate benefit level, support, financial support will be um, for people who are out of bounds, but they're involved with things to try to quit. Involvement that this insurance plan is actually discussing is literally, you sign up for Weight Watchers and you make 11 of 13 classes, and if you don't, you're bounced back to the basic benefit support. And the enhanced is the, um, your health status on all these things is at the highest level. Your blood pressures that will control, uh, et cetera, those kind of things. So that type of thing is coming. I think government is afraid to address the issue of we're not going to do everything for everyone. And I think it was, you know, noble that you would suggest my sons need more. I think the, the real challenge, Robert Samuelson, an economist who actually writes regularly articles in our paper, um, says never has society, a society anywhere in the world, taken resources from the young and invested in the elderly. And that is what the Social Security program and the Medicare program are doing. And just to give you a number that they touched on yesterday, but it went by so fast that people might have missed it. We've referenced the unfunded mandate for the baby boomer generation. Uh, that unfunded mandate, people are suggesting, what it means is there's no tax dollar to support. There's taxes going into health care right now, into Medicare, but they're not enough. The unfunded mandate to care for that cohort of the baby boomer generation is estimated to exceed $60 trillion. And we owe somewhere between, it's going up all the time, 12 and 15 trillion right now, depending on what year you're looking at. And uh, we've got these $1.3 trillion deficits. And then what are we going to find? $60 trillion to care for this baby boomer generation. This is why we're going to have to start talking about doing less because you can't get it on cutting prices. You can cut prices for a while. Um, all the physicians don't need to make the incomes they make as a society. That will only get you a little ways because what's really happening is we're just doing too many things. And so that's the, you're going to hear me keep coming back to that theme. We're going to have to figure out how to do less. And the challenging question you ask is a person more in that Medicare situation is, we want to do things for everyone. The awkward thing is, what are we going to do for the very elderly person that's in the hospital, that's on a ventilator, that we might get them better and we might not get them better? It got distorted with calling these death panels. You know, groups like hospice do remarkable work, and anyone whose family has ever been involved with that finds it one of the most amazing experiences you've ever had to work with people who, for a career, work with these difficult issues. We're going to have to figure out how to get our arms around that because we're either going to continue to fund 
at, at very high levels, people who have those kind of health demands, or we're going to say ultimately to society that has less value and we're going to do a little less of it, as awkward as that is, and now we're going to have resources we can put back into K-12 and we can help uh, college tuition and things like this so people actually got a skill set to compete in the global economy. Because we're not, we know we're not going to do it with hands-on manufacturing jobs. We've got to have high-skilled people, and we're not going to have the tax base to do it. Thank you. Dennis? I provided you an answer that indicated your effort to get primary care and prevention services to your sons was a logical thing to do. Now let me give you the political answer as to why you can't do that. Um, if we were to try to extend the Medicare program, uh, and you were suggesting a Medicare, Medicare extension. Oh, oh, okay. Medicare okay. No, I, I understand. I thought you were suggesting an expansion of Medicare, and if we were to do that, um, the insurance industry would be up in arms because the insurance industry wants to insure all your sons. Basic primary yep. care. They don't need a heart transplant. They don't need surgery. They need basic care. That'll be the cheapest thing. I concur, and I, and I stand by my answer. The insurance industry would be up in arms if we tried to do it as a Medicare expansion. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this discussion. We have other people who would like to ask questions. I'm Henry Grebe. I'm just a private citizen. <laughs> when I was born in 1937, it cost my father $350, and he was making about $150 a month. Uh, he paid it off after several years. I presume, I don't know what he did, but my mother and I were both pretty sick, and mother pulled, uh, pulled through pretty well. That's a standard joke in our family. <laughs> um, somebody mentioned cost of tuition for these youngsters. They'll be surprised to know that in, in 1955 through 59 when I went to school it, at a private university in Denver it cost $540 a year. A year. Not a, not a semester hour, but a year. And it now is $37,000. If it would have gone up by a rate of inflation of 4%, it would be only about $5,000 per year. So the universities have learned to pile it on to the, the people. Um, however, the, the question that I have is, why does it cost 90, uh, $98 for a scan in Japan, and it costs $1,600 or more I guess $1,600 is the Medicare reimburse and reimbursement rate for uh, the same scan in the United States. Why did it cost $35 for an hour consultation in Vienna, Austria with a primary care physician who didn't know anything about my colleague when we were visiting there, but he had a heart problem and he thought he needed a doctor, where it would cost over $100 for a 15-minute consultation in the United States. And why is there, I, somebody told me, this gentleman here told me that there's a three-fold discrepancy in the cost, the, the, the charge that they charge an uninsured person in one of the hospitals in Grand Rapids versus another hospital in Grand Rapids for the same scan. I don't know exactly what that scan is, but a, the list price for these scans have a threefold chain uh, difference in cost. Thank you. Who would like to take that? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> don't lose your courage now. I think basically we have a market model in the U.S. It's uh, what will the market bear? That's what any market is. Um, but in most other markets, the difference is people pay with their own dollar. When you go to restaurants, you totally pay with your own dollar, and that holds it down. And there's a few real expensive restaurants. Basically, most of the restaurants uh, attain a moderate price so they can serve a lot of people. The problem in healthcare is that government pays, 
at a, at a federal and state level, insurance plans, companies pay. There's not a restraint on the price. Um, there's not a restraint on do I really need it. People don't bring ask the same kind of value question in healthcare that they ask in other segments of the economy. And part of what's created some of the extreme divergence of primary care pay, which is still very adequate compared to other uh, uh, jobs in society, um, and but the pay between that and some of the specialists is that primary care com has lots of competition out in the marketplace and it tends to restrain the price. Specialists like radiology and anesthesiology literally exist in micro-monopoly environments and they set a price and tell an insurer this is what I want to charge and if the insurance plan says I don't want to pay that much they say fine I won't participate in the insurance and they balance bill patients and the insurance plan will find that a very difficult thing the patients will complain the employer gets mad and they pay the fee well then they pay it and they can't keep the cost down except by not providing the reimbursement to primary care so primary care is not keeping up with that medical students are figuring this out and they're selecting uh, specialty care overwhelmingly. But the $1,000 versus $100 is about what our market model is doing in this country. And it's why we should be asking serious questions about the design. And you kind of have to almost do a lot of design work in the back room because it gets so uncomfortable out in a public forum that it causes an enormous amount of reaction from all the parties. Thank you. I know we have a couple more questions. Sir? Uh, my name is Laird Schaefer. I'm a citizen or a resident in Grand Haven. Uh, I've benefited from uh, military uh, as well as employer medical care my entire life. I am a baby boomer and now I'm benefiting from Medicare, a BCN Advantage uh, medical plan, also Social Security and a pension. Um, We've mentioned this morning the importance of lifestyle and choices. Uh, it seems that it is generally recognized that smoking, other addictions, uh, obesity, uh, lack of exercise are major factors in uh, the need for health care. And yet there seems to be very little discussion of that in the media. Uh, I do not understand why I or anyone else should be required to support those members of our society which uh, make choices which are recognized as being uh, in leading to potential poor health and frankly while I sympathize with them I do not believe that I should be required to support them. I am prepared to support a any program that provides care to those who have unforeseen uh, things happen to them, be they uh, uh, anything, any of the many diseases we are aware of, uh, but I can't understand a program that rewards people for poor choices. Yes, Mark. I often describe what uh, you've just shared as uh, a mentality in our society where we believe there's a pill or a procedure that will fix me. Um, I don't need to change anything in my lifestyle. I don't need to change my behavior. Uh, but when I get sick, because my behavior uh, uh, exacerbates uh, health problems, um, I don't want to pay for it. My employer doesn't want to pay for it. My government doesn't have enough uh, to pay for it either. Um, so I mean, that is, you know, the the, the multitude of challenges uh, that we face. Um, I, I think it really does take uh, some very intentional, and will take some very intentional wrestling as a society. Um, today, uh, the young people that are hopefully about to graduate from uh, college get a job. In a few short years, they'll probably purchase a home. We as a society would find it completely unacceptable for them to be a homeowner and not have homeowner's insurance. We as a society would not allow them to purchase homeowner's insurance after the fire truck has pulled up to the front door to put the fire out. Um, why do we as a society allow them to choose beer over a very affordable insurance product 
uh, and then expect other people to pay for healthcare challenges uh, that ultimately they will have. Um, another thing which we, we haven't talked about, and, and even from a, it, it doesn't affect so much the young persons, but if you take the average amount of money that an individual spends over their lifetime on health uh, insurance or health costs, the majority of it is at the end. Uh, the last time I checked, the mortality rate for human beings is 100%. Uh, but we as a society <laughs> spend a lot of money trying to prevent the inevitable. So in addition to looking at the underfunding of Medicaid and Medicare, uh, taking personal responsibility for our own health and well-being so that we don't need services, we also need to wrestle with ourselves and our loved ones. Uh, what is it that we want in terms of a quality life or various procedures performed on us uh, when the inevitable comes where we are uh, older and do face uh, more uh, health care issues? Thank you, Steve. I'll, uh, I, you know, again, I, I agree with your point too, and and uh, I, I think those are those are really interesting questions. And in the abstract, I think they're they're easy to solve, but after you start peeling away, uh, you know, it becomes more difficult. I, I think of uh, my great grandfather who I died before I was born, but uh, my my mom tells me my my papa Doggett, who's my great grandfather. <clears throat> smoked a cigar every day. He uh, ate biscuits and gravy every morning. Uh, he drank. Uh, he lived an unhealthy lifestyle by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, lived to be 89 years old, never spent a day in the hospital. Uh, you know, those are interesting things. And then, you know, what about the, the people who, who, who do consume services? And if I Sorry to go back to my maps. It's probably a good thing I wasn't able to bring more <laughs> visuals. I would have killed you all with those things. Um, at any rate, um, but but again, you know, let's consider the mothers that that didn't seek adequate prenatal care, for example. You know, what purport? You know, and I think it's the same thing. It's it's the reason why we support welfare, or you know, we talk about do we really want to punish the child? through no fault of their own, right? It wasn't their choice to be brought into this world. And, and again, how do, we, how do we get that mother to be responsible? I understand the, the consequence of that. And I think those are just, again, you know, the, the really difficult questions to, to solve. Um, and, and, you know, it's, again, it's, it's more than health care. It's the same thing. What about the mother who smoked during pregnancy? What about the mother who drank during pregnancy, right? The effects happen to that child. Again, no fault of their own. How do you disaggregate, you know, what you do to yourself and what your environmental factors do to you as well? Um, again, think again, easy in the abstract. I think all of us can sit around here and think that that perhaps we shouldn't reward people uh, who who do destructive things to themselves. But but I think you know, as long as we can't. We can't disaggregate what is genetic, what is caused by environmental factors, what's caused by self-inflicted harm. Those things are going to be really, really difficult to, uh, to, to get at. Thank you. I think we have one more question. My name is Steve Hilker. I'm a uh, CPA. I've worked in a number of different positions for the uh, state of Michigan. These are my own comments here. The, uh, for uh, Professor Border, the, uh, right now the U.S. finds itself in a position of probably being the most overpromised, underfunded society in the history of the world. Uh, if we take just the national debt, which as of five minutes ago was uh, $12.3 that's $40,000 for each and every person in here. <clears throat> Meanwhile, total U.S. debt, including corporate debt and personal debt, we're looking at 350% of gross domestic product right now, which means if you earn 50000 your portion of that debt would be $175,000 comparatively. So given all that, given that we have our Chinese friends warning us publicly that we're overspending 
uh, given that we already see at the state level crowding out of other expenditures because of Medicaid. Meanwhile, we're moving into the baby boom retirement, which will hit both Social Security and Medicare. It seems like our choices are between reducing the promises that we cannot fulfill or a takeover of the health care system which must be accompanied by severe rationing if it's to be uh, adequately funded. Okay, because the money won't be there. So if you take it over and the money won't be there, what are you going to do? Your comments, please. Thank you. You just think I've been drinking water this whole time. <laughs> so uh, again, I, you know, th those are the things that, that I suppose keep me up at night. Those are the things that I, you know, talk to my dad a lot about. Um, but, but exactly, I mean, you know, that's, that's why I'm a pessimist. Um, because I, I really see, I don't see much of a way out of this. Uh, and 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 I I think that was what upset me so much about the health care reform was was the dishonesty of it. I, I thought it was I thought it was dishonest and and it was a it was dishonest in the sense that that again we promise too much to people that everybody's going to get everything that they want and and life can continue to go on and um, but I, but I don't I, I don't see that happening right. And again, me you know we talk about. You know, uh, again, Michael Tanner was talking about marginal tax rates, and I think you're, you know it is. It's going to be those those moral issues. We we've got the the, the trade-offs between, you know, what do we want to provide our our people, and we've grown accustomed to those things. Uh, you know, and it's uh, it's it's going to be a, a delicate balancing act for for sure. Uh, but but I think you know, taxes have got to go up. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that the taxes have to go up. They, the, the government has got to increase its revenue one way or the other, even in the face of, of cutting benefits. And, you know, that's going to make no one happy. Uh, but, but somebody's got to find the stomach to do it. And, and again, that's what I would say. It won't win anybody any re-election re in Washington, but, but I wish the discussions were, were more honest along the, the, the question that, that you proposed. All right. Anybody else want to try to answer that? I'd just go back to some of the things I was outlining before around primary care. I think you can provide for a basic level of care for people that will bring them quite a bit of benefit. Uh, when you couple it with, uh, we make some more incentives in society, we begin to figure out even how to impact on food and uh, reduce portion sizes. There's a whole bunch of things one could begin to do at a societal planning level. Um, I think that you get good primary care. And when people see primary care physicians, they don't get anything for using technology. And so you tend to, a cardiologist is going to be tempted to order tests. So you don't want your people with high blood pressure seeing cardiologists. You want them seeing primary care physicians. And we're going to have to figure out a variety of uh, expense, market, rationing mechanisms, a variety of things to slow down the consumption of those specialty services. Uh, I do not like seeing everything consumed in healthcare. Uh, I think we put way too much into health care. If we raise taxes, it shouldn't be to support health care because the problem is you still won't, we'll, we'll eat it all up, and then we still won't be able to invest in job creation, in, uh, in transportation cre creation, in education, and things like that. And the end of it will be we still won't be able to afford a health care system, and our society will go downhill. We need to invest in the things that become productive to society. If society evolves and develops and can be a mature, uh, healthy society, it will be able to afford a reasonable amount of health care in the future. If you put too much into health care, it will eat up everything and there'll be nothing left. It will cramp the rest of society. So uh, we've got tough choices. Thank you. Uh, Vondi? When, back when we decided we were going to try to create our own health plan, one of the, we did a poll in the community and one of the things that came back, one of the highest things that polled was that people want choice. And we've, we've come of age in a, in a country where choice is what we all want. So if I want a Louis Vuitton purse for a thousand bucks or I want one from, you know, pennies, 
I have choices and they're wonderful and we've come to expect that in everything. The, the, the reality of it is, is that we, we are very reluctant to make choices that are hard. It is very difficult for us to limit ourselves from the things that we want. When we develop the Access Health product, and I keep going back to that because, you know, we are one of the unique co communities in the country that developed their own health coverage product. It's still working. It's 10 years old, as I said before, and, and if we haven't, it still costs you, you know, 46 bucks a month. When we did that, we had 40 people in the room, community members. They weren't experts. They weren't actuaries. They weren't insurance companies. We had community members in there, and we had to teach people about this thing we call risk. And the way that the facilitator did that was she had a health process on the front. So, you know, if you're going to have a baby or you're going to need this or it's primary care or whatever. And on the back, she had the cost of that service. So you had the service, you had the cost. You couldn't flip the card over. And she said to people, okay, create what it is you want. And so they did. And they, she said, turn over those cards. They turned over the cards and people said, well, this is really expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> guess what? This is what it costs. And then we had to challenge our community members to say, if it's you, if you're going to pull a card out of the deck and say, we're not going to cover it, which one is it? Make the tough decision. Because if it's you who, do, who are uncovered, then what are you willing to live without? And they managed to do that. And they managed to do that in a very creative way where everybody stood up at the end of the day and said, we're going to get criticized because we don't have this or that. But by gosh, we've given people the basics and we've made it affordable. All of these things that we discuss are about not so much what we want, but what we, it's the wants and what we need and what we, you know, what we really have to have, what we want. Somebody, said, somebody sent me that when, you know, my kid went to college. You know, it's what she wants, what she needs. It's what we need. And at some point, we have to resolve that. And it's very difficult in the psychology of this nation to decide that we can't have it all. Bottom line. And when we gave it to Congress, that's exactly what they did. They were unfair to all of us because they tried to put it all in like some big glorious Christmas tree. And in the midst of that, there was a tree. Not without the, without the tinsel, without the stars, without the bulbs. Somewhere in the middle of that, there's a tree that somehow lends itself to being able to move us forward as a nation in terms of dealing with this dilemma. Thank you. Last question. And I'll ask that please make the question succinct. And I've promised we're going to be out of here by noon. So the answers also will have to be succinct. As much a comment as a question. I wanted to talk about the personal responsibility issue. And I think that that's the wrong focus for anybody to take as far as making health care affordable. And not that it's not the right thing to do. But if you start making decisions on whether you offer health care to people based on what their personal decisions are, then I, I, I don't think I could think of five people that would deserve health care. I think, uh, I, I, it, it, what are you going to do? You're going to start counting the french fries that they get at McDonald's? Um, you know, some uh, uh, single parents of, with families, they can feed their family of five cheaper by going through the McDonald's drive through than, than cooking the meal that we think would be nutritious. They get the dollar menu, they, that's cheaper and much more efficient for them. What are you going to ask them to do? The, the, the answer to personal responsibility comes from what Dave is talking about and what Vondi was talking about. Education at a basic level through a primary care base and doing it consistently for everybody. Then you, because then you won't have to make those decisions where Big Brother is watching everything you eat, and it, Big Brother to me is the insurance companies, not the government. So, that's my comment. Steve, I'll, and again, I I agree, and you know, there's so many levels on that, and again, since I'm such a, a data guy. Uh, back to that, that Medicaid data, which I thought was, you know, one of the most fascinating things to me is that on, when they collect the, the birth certificate or the vital records data, there's a, a record, you know, about when you started prenatal care and, uh, you know, information about the mother and the father. You know, which, what to me was so fascinating about the, the Medicaid birth, again, approaching 50 percent 
of all births here in, in Michigan, over 60% in Michigan, Medicaid pays for those. But over 25% of all of those, those vital records, there was no information about the father on the birth certificate. So, you know, and, and, and to me, no information says a lot, right? I mean, it probably says, was that pregnancy planned? Uh, and again, you're thinking about, uh, uh, you know, education and, and, and you know, should, when, do you, when is the appropriate time to, to have a child? Uh, again, that's just one, one small, small facet of that, but I agree, right? It's, it's, it's all of the, the education things. Again, going back to your question is why, why, I'm, why I'm pessimistic is that, you know, where is the money going to come from education, right? I mean, think of the, the budget cuts. And, and again, last night I was reading Engler's uh, 1999 budget, you know, boasting about <laughs> cutting taxes in the, the strong state of, of uh, you know, of, of Michigan and thinking about, you know, where we have come since 2000, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. Uh, you know, too, if we step back to 2000 and think about President Clinton, Clinton, right, we had four years of, of budget surpluses, right? This year we're going to borrow $1.3 trillion. I looked it up before I got here this morning. We're going to borrow alone over $44 billion this week. That's how much the, the United States government is going to sell in Treasury securities this week or what they've sold this week. So. That would fund uh, Michigan for for a year and a half, right? Where's that money going, right? That money is gone, <laughs> and we have to pay that back. I'm worried about the the okay. interest. I'm worried about the ability to pay those things back. I'm worried about the big picture. Uh, and again, right? We get all of these things that everyone on this panel, I think, agrees about how to control costs, but many other things have to come with that as well. Those are the things I, I think that. That, that worry me the most. Yes, thank you, Steve. Bondi? I, you know, I think that, that if I've learned anything in, in the road I've taken is that we're all in this together and it's, um, you know, yeah, there, there's, there is that personal responsibility piece and, you know, we've, we've moved away from giving kids gym classes and, you know, we, we don't pay a whole lot of attention to what they're eating in the school cafeterias and they tell us that those vending machines help, you know, raise money and, you know, so we start on those bad habits early and I remember doing an, another survey with kids in the schools in Muskegon and they all knew what the, the food triangle was all about but they didn't buy the food so they were still eating junk. Um, and then of course they got used to that nice taste of junk. Um, I, I, I think that, that when it comes to personal responsibility, there is a piece of that that we can't just say it's somebody else's problem. Because I, you know, I, I know too many people, including myself, who do go searching for that pill that's going to drop that mm -hmm. quick 20 pounds. We, 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 it's, it's the nature of our, of our communities and, and who we are and the way we've come, to come in, you know, it's like penicillin. Take penicillin, you're going to get well. It didn't make any difference what it was. If you took some penicillin, you're going to be well. And we've come to accept that as a society, which says a lot about the way we educate and the way we get people engaged. I think one of the, one of the lessons of health care reform, at least for me, was that you know we stood on the sidelines and we watched these people debate just as we did with the Clintons where you know you get 300 people in a room and they came up with something and then we all looked at it and we said we don't want that or we were influenced by what others said we have got to become more engaged as, as citizens we have to be health care is no different than any other issue and and the best part of democracy is where you can localize it and get people talking about whether it is indeed good that your school cafeterias serve that kind of junk i've I've had the ability, as I've said before, to travel around the country. I remember meeting a guy who had a series of, of auto stores across North Dakota. And he said, you know, one, and he was self-insured, and he said, you know, one day I walked in, and the guy's behind the counter, he says, I love those guys. He says, they've been working for me for 20, 25 years. And he said, all of a sudden, they know, you know, they're getting kind of gray, and, and they're smoking. And he said, and I like them. I, I mean, they're my best employees. He said, so... 
he didn't take the, the negative piece about if you don't do this, we're going to get you. He said, you know, so I started saying, okay, if you quit smoking, I'll, pay, I'll put 25 bucks more on your paycheck. And if you and your wife are out at the mall and there's somebody out there screening your health conditions and you can bring me back proof you did it, I'll give you each 25 bucks. He, and he was explaining how he had done this and really a pretty phenomenal impact on the guys who worked for them. Human nature is driven by incentive. Whether it's a negative incentive or a positive incentive, it's driven by incentive. We learn that when we're very young. It is a piece of this puzzle. It is a tough piece of the puzzle because we tend not to want to tell people what to do. But ultimately, if we are going to solve this problem, we are going to have to tell not just ourselves but each of our neighbors that these are things we truly do have to do. Otherwise, we, we go on as we are, amassing more debt, sicker, less able to compete in a global economy, and kids who are just up to their ears in debt. You know, I don't want to live in a cardboard box when I'm 65 or 70 because my kid is paying off her student loans and because nothing else is there to support me. I don't think any of us do, no more than those, the students do who are sitting there. But, so by gosh, it is a collective decision, which says to me also, we need to do a better job of teaching political science because, you know, <laughs> one half of the semester of civics and another of American government. Government touches our lives from birth to death and we somehow have mar marginalized that as well. Well, thank you. On those wise words, we will end. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gvsu.edu.